is a Aurora anniversary. Um, they released an older style nib on this pen. A flex nib means that as you press on the paper, the tines open up. The opening of the tines allows for more ink to flow and it varies the line. So as you, if you don't press, it makes a fine line. The harder you press and the more the tines spread, the wider the line becomes. So it doesn't fill the space in between the two tines then? Um, it will unless you press very hard and spread them far apart in which case it'll, you'll cause it to write two lines with an empty space in between. And if you've seen some elaborate calligraphy, you'll, uh, you'll be familiar with what that looks like. Excellent. Let's go over here. Take sure. a look at the collection you have over here. And I'll have you stand here. You were uh, just explaining uh, to a lady, she was looking at some pens and uh, you had said, I think that pen is too big for you, and you almost made a prescription, like a doctor prescribes medication to a patient, and you prescribed a smaller pen to her. Why a smaller pen? Um, that particular instance wasn't so much the size of the pen itself, it was the width of the nib, uh, or the width of the tip of the nib. Um, I, felt, I thought that pen fit in her hand comfortably, but her writing was so small that a nib size that is too large would have caused her to close the loops. So an O and an A, an E, those all would have been closed dots on the paper. By using a very, very fine tip nib, she was able to write and keep all those loops open and it looks more natural. So I'm starting to see the benefit of coming to a pen show and actually trying pens out in front of somebody who knows what they're talking about. Just ordering something online like I have is kind of hit or miss. So it really helps to have that blank piece of paper and watch the person write something before they purchase and before you can accurately prescribe. Yes, if you have the opportunity to get to a show, not only will you find a large group of very like-minded people that you'll enjoy interacting with, but there's, it's very difficult to replicate the experience of putting it in your hand. It, pens vary in weight, they vary in material, they vary in girth, and that's just the pen itself. Then the nibs also vary in width, and some of them are cut round, some of them are cut square. Tell people what a nib is. I'm, I have an audience that might not even know what a nib is. Absolutely. The nib is the front of uh, the top of the pen that actually releases the ink. So this is what writes on the paper. For those of you who are too young to remember what these things are. <laughs> and they come in different uh, materials, is that correct? A great, uh, the nibs themselves you mean? Yes. Yes, they typically are either steel, gold, or palladium. Those are the three materials that are most prominent for using to make nibs. Is it necessary for them to be flexible? It is not necessary at all, and some people prefer that they are not flexible. But the best way to discern that is to get the pen in your hand. Get the pen in your hand. <laughs> you have to blow back into the furnace. We're talking with Bert Oser from, what is your company? Bertram's Inkwell in Rockville, Maryland. And he actually started the, the former owner of the Philly Pen Show that I had no idea a pen show existed. And you have a retail location, where is that? In Rockville, Maryland, been there since 1985. And what is your website? Bertram'sInkwell.com. And tell us about pen shows. Now you are kind of a, for lack of a better term, kind of like the patriarch here of, I was guided to you. Yes. Someone said to me, if you want to know about pen shows and pens and people and ink and paper, you need to talk to Bert. So Mario brought me right to Bert. Yeah, well, Mario's a good friend. Thank you, Mario. Um, I took over the Miami, the Philadelphia pen show about 20 years ago, uh, running a, a retail store and, and manning a, manning a Pen show takes a lot of responsibility, a lot of time. So about five years ago, I turned it over to Franklin Kristoff out of uh, North Carolina, uh, and now he's got the reins of the pen show. Uh, what's exciting about today is that we're back at the uh, Sheraton, uh, or now 201 Hotel in downtown Philadelphia, uh, where we used to be. Um, 
when they took it over, they moved it to another location, but we're back here at the same hotel. So we've been, this show's been running for about 28 years now uh, at various, various uh, properties throughout the city, this one being the longest. And uh, we bring folks from up and down the East Coast in here looking for vintage fountain pens, older ones, you know, from 1900s or earlier, um, papers, pens, inks. Uh, we have pen repair people here fixing fountain pens where they take a nib and, and grind it just right for that, that, that signature hand, uh, handwriting. Uh, we sell wooden pencils, uh, refills for your pens, just about everything. Collectible pens, be it limited edition where there's a finite number made, to what's, what's new and what's hot in the pen industry. What is the hottest thing in the pen industry? Wow, that's a really good question. Depending on which vendor you talk to, with theirs is the hottest thing in the industry. Uh, but limited editions have always been very collectible. Mont Blanc is a winner with making limited editions. Uh, another Italian, Italian company called Viscani makes some really wonderful pens. Uh, Yaffa out of uh, California uh, is very innovative with all the brands that they come out with, be it Conklin, which is a remake of a pen company that went bankrupt many many years ago and they brought that pen company back to life uh, he also makes a lot of the refills and inks for all the people here to you know have all the different colors and to, it's always a variety of different things I'm finding that um, it's it's about more than just pens it's about more and I discovered it's about ink it's Absolutely. about paper and it's about the people this is not the average crowd that I run into. Tell me about the people that come to pen shows. Uh, the people are as varied as they can possibly be. From the young, the new kids coming up, wanting to just enjoy the, the feel of writing with a fountain pen, to people that have been collecting pens for 40 and 50 years. I've got customers that are 75, 80 years old, and they have collections anywhere from 200 to 2,000 pens. Wow. Uh, it's a very tight-nipped community. Uh, at the end of a pen show, you'll see a people gathering at the bar, the restaurant, 20, 30 people on one table, handing out pens, exchanging ideas, d trying different papers, trying different ink colors, and all in a very communal sense that no one has any problems loaning or letting another person try their pen. So it's a, it's a good group of people, and young and old. If you've got pens, you're, you're, you're welcome at the table. Let me ask you this. Why fountain pens? Fountain pen has a feel to it when you write with it. If you pick up a ballpoint pen, which basically there's thousands of ballpoint pens all over the world that people just pick up. You go to the bank, you pick up a pen, you don't think twice about taking it with you. It's not even stealing it. They're just You just have pens everywhere. Just go to any hotel room. There's free pens everywhere. Whereas a fountain pen, we need to slow down. We need to fill the pen. We need to make sure it's filled properly. We need to wipe off the nib to make sure there's no excess ink. And then we put the nib to paper in a specific way. We don't just plonk the tip down. We actually put the pen on paper, and then make definitive, defined strokes. We slow down, we think, our handwriting improves, and your handwriting with a fountain pen is, anyone's handwriting with a fountain pen improves and looks much better than with just a cheap ballpoint pen where you're just scribbling nonsense. That's been a theme with my channel for a few years now, slowing down. That's why we like things like Zippo lighters, things that are not disposable. Not we like at all. We like, we like things that you have to take care of, things that require maintenance, things that require care. Yep. Uh, I smoke a 100-year-old Dunhill, 104-year-old Dunhill pipe, and I always say, imagine this thing has been through uh, two world wars. It's been through every uh, major world conflict. It's comforted the hearts and souls of many people. I would imagine a fountain pen is the same way where it wrote letters of congratulation, it wrote letters of grief, it wrote condolences. Absolutely. The handwritten note is something that we promote a lot uh, in the shop where you, if you, you know, uh, are invited to a party or you want to give thanks to someone or to a, a condolence card, a handwritten note, hand addressed, is always going to be something that stands out in that pile of junk mail that you get and people really appreciate that you took the time to write hey Joe thanks for coming over last night thanks for the bottle of wine we had a really good time or whatever uh, just there's a whole group of people that will put out a list of names all over the country and we'll just send a note to somebody just you know to encourage them for the day or what it, whatever it might be I was also in my reading I saw that there, you might be waiting in line somewhere at a bank or in a grocery store, and if you happen to glance at someone's hands, 
and you see an ink stain, <laughs> the pen people get like a little smirk on their face. Why is that kind of like the badge of honor in the pen world? Well, it's funny you say that because uh, on a busy Saturday at the shop when we got a lot of things going on, people bringing in their pens for repair or trading or just showing off pens, filling pens, demonstrating pens, I will inevitably have my hands covered with ink. Do you, do you have so, ink on your hands now? I do not. It's a little too early in the morning yet. I so. think I saw something there. Well, there's always a little bit. But Wait, right there. There we go. There's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the badge of yes. honor. But I will come home with my hands covered with ink, and people are wondering, what in the world did you do today? I said, when my hands are covered with ink, I've had a busy day at the shop. Oh, so it's, it's all good. That's great. How can people find you on the web? Very easily. Bertramsinkwell.com. Excellent. Bert, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm talking with Lisa Van Ness, who is a leader in the pen industry, fountain pens, and you just taught a class here this morning, and I couldn't make it because the trains were 20 minutes late, but I'm glad that uh, that Mario brought me over to you. You're you're kind of a an icon in the pen industry. Uh, I don't think so, but I uh, I do love pens. I love inks, and I love uh, teaching. So that combination, and I'm a little bit of an extrovert, so that combination worked out really well for me to um, help bring young people and females into the pen community because it's really traditionally male. Like it is. You're right. So you're kind of like the matriarch. <laughs> of the of the pen industry i guess well it's me and several others but i had somebody before me that um she trained me and she's passed on and i wanted to continue the tradition and uh, i feel like that social media and modern technology has allowed us to like bring in a whole new generation that like appreciates writing and color and um just the general um, analog community they're kind of going back to their roots of non-BIC. We don't need any more BICs. I got into pens because I want to improve my cursive writing, and that led me to fountain pens. And I have several clients that are into fountain pens who brought them into the salon where I work and started sharing things with me and giving me different pens to write with, and I felt the difference. Mm -hmm. um, why... Why a fountain pen? Well, so there's lots of different reasons, but for me, you can get a more personal touch to your writing. So you can write with, if you write with a throwaway ballpoint, you get one line and that's it. You can't add some personality to your writing. And so if you want some character and you want to like put your character into words, then a pen is the, a fountain pen is the way to do it. So you can write with an extra fine needle point and write super tiny, or you can write these big, wide, loose letters with a color of ink that puts your stamp on it. So you can your favorite color, find it in an ink, put thank you notes out, put letters out, put write in your journal in a color that makes you happy. And when you have an italic, for an example, or a stub nib, you get to add personality in a way that people appreciate and um, are excited to receive letters. Like they want to see your writing, they want to see um, what you have to do and what you have to say on print. And that's something that's kind of gotten lost. And um, you know, the art of a thank you note, like me being from the South, the South is still really into thank you notes. The South, it. as in? Where oh, are you I'm from? from Arkansas. Okay. Um, and uh, by the way, it snowed here, and this is like huge for me. Huge. <laughs> um, so um, anyway, the whole town would be shut down where I live. Right. Um, so um, the art of like writing a letter, it, it makes people happy. It makes people feel like you care. And so improving your writing and journaling and writing thank you cards, just it makes you happy. It makes you feel better. It's cathartic, and people. Um, like we all want to see um, 
we all want to see that somebody cares. And when you write a thank you note in a fountain pen ink that's not something standard, like you can get a color that, 2,000 different colors. So you can write this really cool color and add a little bit of personality and people just feel so special. And they should feel special because there's somebody important to you. Like when you write a happy birthday card, why not add the special note that's not in a ballpoint? Yes. Add it in your favorite blue-green color. Like. I work with a lot of authors and they do a lot of book signings and I can just imagine doing a book signing with a, a fountain pen and of course that would make a more dramatic signing on the you know the inside cover of a book and I think I'm going to start mentioning that to my author friends yeah you totally should there's actually a large writing community that participates within the fountain pen community and um, we even have several author authors locally that shop with us and they they enjoy um, do you just want to use a permanent or a document ink so that it's there in a hundred years you know because mm. um, you don't want something that's going to smear um, I'm so. fans of things that are a hundred years old and the fact that you mentioned that is uh, everything is so throwaway so temporary so disposable and there is a permanence about fountain pens uh, if you hold a fountain pen that's a hundred years old that pen I was saying this to Bert may have written condolences yeah. Happy it notes. Wrote everything it, they did in in a day because you wrote it. You wrote all your notes about work. You wrote all your notes about life. You wrote all your notes about school. Do you think inanimate objects hold things in them? Like I, like I have a uh, I have a hundred year old pipe. I was telling Bert, a uh, hundred year old Dunhill pipe, and I and I know when I smoke it. There's times where I imagine the people that might have puffed on it. Yeah. It lived through two world wars, every major world conflict. It comforted a father that might have lost a son. It, you know, it just has been through so much. And I think fountain pens are in the same vein. They are. They are. And you know what's really fun is if you can find a vintage fountain pen with somebody's name on it, we have customers, and I'm guilty of doing it too, hunting down like that person's story. Like when they're, because it was something that, because our family had the fountain pen store in the 30s. And most everybody, you like it was your essential instrument of life. Like mm. that, there was no ballpoints. There was no so you. That was your item. It was super important to you, and um, you needed it. And so you can, you know, they put their name on it because it's something they had to have every day. Mm. And so you can go and read their story, and it's super cool to find those. And you sometimes you don't ever know if that's the right person. But yeah. it's kind of cool when you figure out if it is, like if it's a retirement pin from the railroad, for example, mm. and you see this person's name and they retired from the railroad in like 1940, you realize you can find their story. And like that's, it's kind of cool to know that this person did this thing for a living and then you can imagine what they did with it, how they mm. used it to record every everything they did every day. So I, I think that's kind of cool. I, 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 feel the, I feel the connection for sure. I think people that like old stuff are are they called like antiquarians? Is that I think that's the name. It's like people Some who of like called hoarders. <laughs> yeah, hoarders, right? <laughs> exactly. But there's a group of people that love old stuff. It's yeah. the love of old classic things that aren't disposable. In a hundred years, no one's going to hang on to a big pen, but they're going to hang on to a fountain pen, and there's going to be a history to it. An old waterman. Ah. Uh, Listen, I would love to do an interview with you uh, on Google sometime and just get a little bit deeper into it. And I know this was kind of rushed and unplanned, but a lot of people are going to see this particular interview. How can people find you in the future? Well, you can come by, if you ever hang out in Little Rock, Arkansas, you can find us at 11610 Pleasant Ridge Road, and that's between Nukes and Santo Coyote, which is great food. Or you can find us online at Venice1938.com. And 1938, because that's when the business was founded by my husband's granddad. And um, so you can find us there. Or you can find us at a lot of the pen shows. I usually throw parties at a lot of these in the evening to help people learn more about pens. And uh, also to bring people together who are insecure about asking questions. Like, don't be afraid to come up and ask us. So um, I'll be in Baltimore in March. I'll be in L.A. in February. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine and I, that's, she's a blogger. She and I are going to do Route 66. 
Oh, that's fantastic. I'm super excited. Talking about vintage, like, we're so excited. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was hunting down motels from the 50s, you know? Like, that's... Anyway, so I get sidetracked. Like little motor lodges where you park in front of your room, like that kind yes, of... Yes, yes. Yeah. Some of them are booked all the way to April, so I was like, eh. Oh, so you can amazing. find us at all over the country, but also you can find us at the store. It's kind of nice to have a brick and mortar you can go hang out at, and my husband can repair that old pen while you read up on the details of it. So. I love it. I can't wait to interview you, and I think what I want to do on our... Uh, our interview is I want to since I missed the class that you taught this morning maybe we'll do that class for a couple million people online sure. and we'll do that so um, I'll make sure I get your contact well, information than my normal class of 30. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have made it I, I the trains were slow today because of the snow so anyway so y'all were affected by the snow yes Everything was off 20 minutes today in the city, so. In Little Rock, it would have been off by 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> the difference between the North and the South. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pleasure talking with yeah. you, Lisa, and I look forward to exploring more about the pen culture and lifestyle from well, it's you. It's great to meet you. Thank you for stopping and visiting with me. And uh, I'll see, maybe I'll see you in Baltimore. Who knows? You live here, right? I do. Yeah, you gotta go to another pen show. I think I might do that. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Well, it's parts these leftovers. I was trying to sell them, but I don't. After talking with Lisa, she pointed over to Ralph Reyes and she said, "He is the future of fountain pens." <laughs> and you know, it's interesting meeting all these people. And I said, "Do you think he'll?" talk to me she says oh my god yeah absolutely he's the friendliest guy here so we're talking to ralph reyes hello hello how's it going good man good yep, yep. let's let's talk about pen shows sure thing, yeah. give me a little recap a little recap of the pen show oh well, we had a three-day weekend where uh, uh let's see uh, uh many people from around the the country uh, all kind of gathered under one roof to be able to kind of share uh their passion with each other uh in in <laughs> just hundreds, hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, uh, following through, uh, all incredibly passionate, all incredibly kind, um, and all of us friends. It's an incredible. Um, one, one of the things that's really astounded to me about pen shows is that it's not. A lot of people think that it's, uh, it's, uh, they can be a little bit uh, stiff, or they can be a little bit unwelcoming, but it's absolutely not the case. See, for me, being a little bit of a younger person coming to these pen shows, I, I thought originally that um, heading over to the ven uh, vintage vendor tables and, uh, and. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, being around um, what I expected to be a much older crowd, I thought that I'd be brushed away, kind of ignored, not really taken seriously, but it was completely the opposite. These people are the most welcoming people in the world, the most passionate people in the world, and uh, and the, the passion and the love that they all share for this one hobby is uh, is what keeps me coming back to all these different shows all around the country. So uh, yeah, the Philadelphia Pen Show was an absolute phenomenal success. Where do you live? I'm from Chicago. You came to Philadelphia from Chicago for a pen show. Yep, for three days for a pen show, absolutely. When I heard that there was a, a three-day pen show, <laughs> and that they were, you could get a daily pass or a weekend pass, and I thought to myself, a three-day pass to a pen show. Now, you gotta realize, I, I'm not a pen guy, but I'm starting to be, and only after being here for a few hours can I see why you can spend three days at a pen show. It's not long enough, man. <laughs> it's not long enough. There's so much to see. The thing about pen shows is that you can see things. You can you can find things at pen shows you would not be able to discover any place else. You wouldn't be able to even hear about it on the internet. Be, be, being able to wander through and whether it's like, you know, uh, all the range of all the new um, unheard of emerging modern makers or if it's the range of uh, over a century year old vintage pens, ones that you've never that haven't even been properly cataloged or like, you know, or, or you know, or, or documented or or you know, ones that people are even aware of. Um, but uh, yeah, they, uh, 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 yeah, but all of all all of these things. There's a, an abyss, an abyss of things to explore. And I, and I, you know, for me, I, I collected for fountain, fountain pens for a while before ever visiting my first pen show. 
um, you know, I, I would go on Reddit and like, you know, R Fountain Pens, uh, the subreddit, and then like, uh, I, I'd go through online, watch all of Brian Goulet's videos and et cetera, you know, just discover everything that I could about fountain pens. But I'll tell you this, everything that I, and no matter how many hours you spend online, no matter how hard you search, you will not come even close to the amount of knowledge you can absorb from just like a 30 minute conversation with a person that's been living their entire lives in this in this world and it's 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 astounding yeah i'm amazed at this i'm going to ask you the question that i ask everybody why fountain pens why fountain pens all right i'm glad you asked a lot of people like to talk about fountain pens being a personal object. A lot of people like to talk about fountain pens being an item of distinction and 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 uh, and and, um, and of a luxury. You know, um, to me, fountain pens are. I, I start the thing of what I love about fountain pens. Why I think fountain pens are so phenomenal is that before the the dawn of the keyboard, right? The one instrument that we had to record our thoughts, feelings, and emotions, everything, was a pen, right? For, countries were for, 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 were for, were formed with a pen. Wars were, for, were were fought with a pen, right? Um, for the longest time, hundreds of years, the, the entire the reason why our language looks the way it does, the letters are formed the way it does, is because of the, of the instruments we had available to us, right? And the the fountain pen, after years of using, um, you know, chisel and stone, um, the quill and ink, right? All of these things that were extremely difficult to be able to record information. The fountain pen came around, right? The fountain pen came around and became the one item, an all-inclusive instrument that you could actually use to record knowledge, right? And that, and when when the fountain pen came around, that's when uh, around like you know the early 1900s, and especially when they popped out around the 50s, that's when we had the explosion of of uh, you know of you know the progress of civilization and the uh, recording of history and everything else and the thing that's so amazing to me and to answer your question more directly why fountain pens fountain pens the, the reason to me like why fountain pens are so beautiful is that back in the day right when when fountain pens were first created the whole reason why they were so important is because uh, fountain pens needed to have a gold nib back then because metallurgy hadn't reached a point where stainless steel was created all metals would corrode in the presence of ink mm. so gold had to be used so naturally it had to be a luxury item so the whole idea behind a fountain pen was is that instead of like uh, disposing of these these like corroding uh, dip nibs every two weeks you had this one inclusive writing instrument and it would be your partner for a lifetime so to me what's so beautiful about it is that these people search search for their one partner right their one partner to be able to express their thoughts feelings and emotions to be able to place a line on the page the way that they wanted to to be able to have the feel in the hands that they wanted to um, to be able to write love letters, to be able to write, like, you know, to just express themselves. Um, they search for that one pen and that one pen only that they would have for a lifetime. And, and the thing that's beautiful is that, you know, these pens have outla out outlived their owners. A lot of these pens still exist today. And I have like, you know, I have a couple hundred pens now, a lot of them vintage and a lot of them over a hundred years old. And I don't know who they belong to, but it's astounding to me. It's beautiful to me knowing that this pen that I'm holding may have lived one or two lifetimes. I don't know who it belonged to. I don't know like, you know, where it's been or what it wrote, but I can imagine like, you know, where it's been and it, the fact is that it's in my hands right now. And whether it's vintage or modern, you know, it's an item of expression. It's a tool, you know, to, to, you know, just be more intimate with yourself. And, but the thing that makes it most important to me is the fact that like the search for the perfect fountain pen is like almost like, it's like a, like a romantic search. You never know if you're going to find that one true partner, but someday you might. And I don't know if I'm ever going to be satisfied, but I'm going to keep searching until that day. I have to say, I got goosebumps <laughs> when you said to, about finding a life partner in a pen that just blows me away and I, I have said the same thing about tobacco pipes that we're just merely stewards of a pipe they're going to outlive us that's it yeah and, absolutely yeah and some of my hundred year old pipes i think about how they comforted people i think about how they celebrated with a pipe i think about at the end of a long day a man sat on his front porch or out in his garage puffing out a pipe thinking about uh his mother that passed away, the celebration of a new job, his daughter that got married, uh, a, a bad medical diagnosis, the start of a world war, the end of a world war, and and at Lisa talked about like the analog life <laughs> versus the digital life. Um, it's goosebumpy just thinking about it, and your passion just blows my mind. I would love to do a, a 
longer interview with you sometime online, kind of a split screen Google Hangout or something, if you'd be willing to do that. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. (laughs) I'm talking with Ralph Reyes. How can people find you, Ralph? You can reach me on Instagram at ReachingRalph uh, or on my website at regaliawritinglabs.com. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. And the people are great. Uh, a lot of the people here in this show I've known for 30 years, and we all love each other's uh, collections. If not each other, we love each other's collections. No, we like each other. Let me see your fingers. See, I'm an official, an official pen user, pen repairman, calligrapher. And I'm just lazy about washing my hands. Let me ask you the question that I'm asking everyone today. Why fountain pens? Well, I can give you that answer uh, differently than probably other people. Uh, Ballpoint pens are evil. Uh, A ballpoint pen is a little oily, greasy ball bearing at the end of a stick. And you're trying to aim that pen in a certain direction to make your letters or to do your drawings. But because it's a greasy, oily ball at the end of a stick, it wants to slide out under to whatever is the least resistant. So you have to spend more time, or more energy anyway, holding the pen tighter. And you get writer's cramp in about 30 seconds. Or a, a fountain pen, on the other hand, will uh, not have that issue, and you don't get tired. Bygone areas. Okay. And they stage events. Okay. And they had, you know, they stage battles. Okay. Where your shield may be an old refrigerator door. Oh, oh neat. Okay. Stuff like that. So a friend of of me and I, we dressed up and we went because it was going to be a social and a ball afterwards. Okay. And a friend of ours showed up. We didn't know he belonged. And he was wearing a lion cloth. <laughs> and if you've never been kissed on the hand by a guy with a lion cloth, Loincloth, you haven't lived. Oh, well, I will, I will add that to my bucket list. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Jerry. And your company is? Additive Pens. Uh, excellent. And tell us what you have. So this is a 3D printed eyedropper pen. Uh, it's basically one of the older eyedroppers. You just syringe the ink in, but we have these internal channels that the inks flow through. The great thing about this is that the ink rests on the different chamber walls of the pen. So instead of directly exerting the pressure onto the feet, you also alleviate some of that onto the walls itself. That gives a more smooth writing experience. There's less burping, there's less uh, leakage. And overall, they still retain the great flow qualities of a good eyedropper. Can I try it? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Awesome. So here's an extra find that you can look at. It's a gray one that's 750, and there's another pearl, which is sort of a pearly, sort of this, like this, but solid all over the entire pen. They're about 17. I like it. It's so light. So it's like our main attraction is mostly the sloshing of the ink, though. How you can see the ink go through the up and downs of the Such a nice visual. Thank you. How was the show for you so far? Good, good. It's the first show where I had lots of pens to sell, so that's been great. Excellent. How can people find you? Uh, online, we're at Additive Pens uh, on Instagram, Facebook. Also, I have a website called www.additivepens.com. We start filling the bottles, the big bottles, putting them in the box. This is. I'm talking with people from the home team here at PhiladelphiaPens.com. Stop by their table, and. My question that I've been asking everybody so far is why 
fountain pens. Tell me, why fountain pens? Well, they're just such an incredible variety of pens, different kinds of nibs. Uh, people refer to them as pen points. Um, lots of different kinds of designs for the actual pen holder, the actual pen that uh, you can choose from. There are stiff nibs, flexible nibs, and flexible nibs are really a lot of fun because they are such a, there's such an incredible variety in degrees of flexibility and what you can do with them. It takes a little practice to work up with them, but uh, it's worth the effort. It's really nice to use, and I just simply enjoy using a fountain pen. I knew I was going to like you because of the uh, tweed coat. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see a lot of tweed coats, but i it's such a classic statement, I think. Definitely. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And you had said something about, I'm just going to let you say it. I can't paraphrase it. Go ahead. Well, when you, when you write with a fountain pen, it is thinking. You are thinking as you are writing. It is a flow. There is space. There is time to reflect. You are looking at what you are creating, and you are are off with thinking about the words that you are going to be putting on paper and it is it's magic it is not like a typewriter it's not like texting there is this space that surrounds the motion of using a fountain pen that is so magical I love that what is your first name I'm Jacqueline 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 and Richard. Richard from PhiladelphiaPens.com. I was directed to Michael McGettigan by the folks at PhiladelphiaPens.com, and I had heard that there is a a pub night or a pub. Yeah. Oh, we call it pub letters. Pub letters. Yes, it's uh, basically uh, instead of going to a bar and staring in, down into a cell phone and into a, and your face turns blue, instead you can come to a pub and stare down onto a piece of paper or a letter or a postcard, which I find. Uh, doesn't close people off the way that a phone does. And uh, it gives you something to do instead of just sitting there drinking a beer. You can drink a beer and write a letter. Uh, my theory is that anybody can write a good letter in a space of one drink, maybe two drinks. Three drinks, and it might get maudlin. But two drinks, you can usually bang out a good letter. And uh, we bring everything the people need to write a letter. We bring. Uh, I, I show up with a Samsonite slimline briefcase full of stationary stamps, envelopes, uh, we bring a cheat sheet with the mailing addresses for uh, the Pope, Sonny Rollins, Tig Notaro, uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, the Screaming Females, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, and a host of others. And then people sometimes write them love letters. We have some politicians who get hate letters. And when we're all done, we usually go from about 7 to about 9. Uh, I bundle everything up and I drop it off in the mailbox on the way home. Uh, we got sponsorship from Yards Brewing was helping us out and also Trophy Bikes. Uh, I'm one of the people associated with Trophy Bikes. Uh, 
in past lives, I've been a reporter, and I know that one of the things that uh, really helps historians and so on is uh, actual written evidence. I don't know where emails are going and texts. Most of them just disappear. But I have gone to flea markets or opened up a book and a hundred-year-old letter falls out. And uh, as a result of that, when we do pub letters, we do ask everybody to put Philadelphia and the date at the top of the letter to give future historians a clue or future flea marketers, whoever, you know. So uh, Pub Letters is always on Tuesday night. It goes to a different Philadelphia bar every month. So uh, next month, it's going to be at the Standard Tap in Northern Liberties. The month after that, it's going to be at McNally's and Chestnut Hill and so on. You can always find it by going to uh, publetters.com or just go uh, follow Pub Letters on Instagram or Twitter. We're not uh, Luddites. We believe in letters, but we also believe in technology and so on. But to me, an email, nobody goes, oh boy, I got an email. But now, thanks to the way society has changed, people go, wow, I got a letter. And I think that's interesting. It's been stood on his head. You know, when you, when I am uh, pretty old, and I remember getting emails and go, oh my gosh, I got an email. Nobody says that now. Right. People go, oh my gosh, I got 600 emails. But if you send someone a real ink on paper letter, it sticks around. So that's the thinking behind pub letters. And, uh, it especially overlaps with all these pen people because it gives you another chance to air out your pen in a way that people always did. You know, back in the days, I, uh, New York, Philadelphia, and London used to have a morning, midday, and afternoon postal deliveries. Yes. And I, yes. And, and I feel like uh, now some of the pub letters, we just bring postcards, and some of the people only write two lines. But that's two lines more than they would have written. And I, I hate coming into a bar and seeing everybody staring at their phone. Or worse, you go into a cafe and they're all staring at laptops. Uh, I think somehow when people are writing letters, they, they go to each other, hey, what are you working on? And so on. And uh, I, one of the most, my favorite things that happen in a pub letters is you'll see a couple and they're actually writing letters to each other. And you'll see them sort of semi shielding the letter, they fold it up, and it's just, you know, and I, they hand in the letters, they, they have the same address, and I realize they're writing to each other. You know. What? What possessed you to start something like this? Uh, I was on my second pint of Yards IPA at Doobie's Bar, and Patty Doobie, the owner, tremendous David Bowie fan. Uh, she has a kind of wild uh, approach to life, and we were both complaining about how people were looking at their phones, nobody writes letters anymore. And I was like, well, why don't people write letters in bars? And then I uh, bar letters, this and that. I got on my phone, and publetters.com was not registered. So I registered publetters.com. So a smartphone helped me make up pub letters. There was one guy that registered pub hyphen letters. He makes signs for bars in England. So, so he didn't, he hyphenated it, but I got pub letters in one piece. And uh, I said, oh my God, now I own publetters.com. What are we going to do? I came up with the context and how we would do the things. And we sort of tried it at Doobies. Then I tried it at another bar. And in 2016, we did pub letters every single month. And we got a Best of Philly mag. And we got written wow. up and so on. And it's starting to get legs. This year, I'm going to take the idea to the U.S. Postal Service. And I'm talking to some ad firms, and we're going to try and develop it further. And I really think, I think it shouldn't just be happening in Philly. It can happen, happen elsewhere. But I think to, for that to happen and not just, turn, I don't want it to be like Pub Letters wet t-shirt night. I want it to be like Pub Letters brought to you by something. So I'm going to talk to the post office, um, talking to Yards Brewing to see what they can do. And I really think it'd be great if you went to a bar in some other city and boom, every, you knew every Tuesday night was Pub Letters mm. night. That's what I'm hoping on. I've got a pretty big network, and I'm happy to share that network with you and share this news. What am I on? What network are we on here? This is my YouTube. This is my YouTube channel, George Bruno. That's all it is. Is my name, and I reach okay. about 1.5 million people. Welcome out there in George Bruno TV. <laughs> no, there we go. Yeah, I didn't know what network I was on. Okay. Absolutely. So. Do you have a specialty, George? Not to interview you. I have a variety show uh, that I do every morning, and it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Okay. And since I fell down this rabbit hole, what I learned was that pen shows aren't just about pens; it's about people. And it's been an exciting experience here interviewing a lot of people, meeting a lot of people, and I think I'm going to actually end up at the Baltimore show when it's all said and done next month. Uh, when I went over to the table over there, PhiladelphiaPens.com, they directed me to you, and life is so much richer when you get to know people. 
more than you get to know things. Yeah. That's what I have found. These things, and I, if there's anything that connects people directly, it's uh, marks on paper. Yes. It's something that we learned how to do really early in, when we created civilization. And it was the first, and originally, I mean, it was scribes. The king said to a scribe, tell them I want 300 oxen. And then it went to another scribe who read it to the king because the kings couldn't be bothered with learning to write. But once we started to put stuff in envelopes, that's when it became personal. And it's much more personal than the stuff we send on email, which is, it's not only is it just out in the open, it's like guaranteed to be read and exploited for some miserable commercial purpose. Mm -hmm. And I guess someone could open my email and try and sell me something based on it, but it would take them forever. And that's what I love is that you have this little package created by the, uh, you know, that's handled by the U.S. government, not to spy on you, but to get your stuff somewhere in yes. a little sealed package. And then someone else opens it up. And there's these marks you made on paper that might probably mean nothing to anybody else but you and them. And in a time when everything's trying to be big, 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 anything that can be small, just yeah. go dot to dot, you know. And the, that's the thing here. Is just some people I see only at the pen show. I, I've seen them five times, and I've only seen them at the pen show. And that's what's kind of astonishing. There's also a, a guy comes and he's, tw uh, we have a birthday book over there. Yeah. You find your date in the book and you write your autograph on that day. That was something the Victorians did. You found a calendar and you wrote your autograph and people collected them. This guy came here, he's 20 years old. His name, all I know is he's a bite messenger from New York. He has a beautiful half graffiti, half autograph signature, Dane. And he's 20 years old. He has an awesome fountain pen. He has an awesome marker and he has an awesome signature, much better than mine. So I'm going, okay, this pen thing's in good hands. It's not going to stop, you know, it, it's, it's coming back. And when you have someone 20 years old that's into this stuff, I go, wow, cool, you know? Pens outlive us, letters outlive us. Yeah. We're just merely stewards of these tools. Yep. Yeah. I look forward to getting to know you and also uh, the pub, pub letters. Uh, just go to pub letters on Instagram or Twitter. Go to publetters.com. It's always on a Tuesday. It's always at a congenial bar, and it's always free. Yep. Michael McGettigan. See you out there? Write some letters, wherever you are. Attorney by day and Niv Maven by night. Joshua Lacks. Yep. Like and a what by night? Niv Maven. And tell, most of my crew does not know what that means. What sure. does that mean? So in the fountain pen world, you have a pen and you have a nib. And the nib might be fine or it might be broken or not writing correctly or you may just want to change so the gentleman that owns this pen bought it it's uh the size of the width of the nib is a fine but he wants it even finer so you go to your nib maven nib meister people usually call them nib meisters i like the addition nib maven a little better so i go by nib maven uh you come to me, I can make it thinner so that it writes a very fine line, which you can see here. I can show you what it looked like originally uh, from a different different model pen with the same nib. Um, and so that's that's what I do when I set up a show. Hey, uh, Mark, uh, do uh, nib work, uh, nib grinding, variety of uh, nibs uh, and nib work. Anything from italics and architects, uh, different styles of nib grinding. Um, yeah, that's basically it. And you've got the inky fingers. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> have the inky fingers. It uh, takes a little bit to get a, maybe a few days, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll come out. Why fountain pens? Yeah, so fountain pens, you know, it gives you a lot of options and uh, a lot of uh, characteristics so you can vary the types of ink that you may use. Uh, you can vary the, uh, the different size of the nibs and uh, uh, the type of nibs that you may have. Uh, gives you line variation and just, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a connection to something uh, in this digital world. It gives you a little connection to an analog type system. So, uh, you know, the, kind of a resurgence of journaling and stuff like that. It, you know, it gives you options as to a standard ballpoint pen and what have you. So. I'm going to say it's going to be about the same. I have a very small handwriting. Yeah. 
so you want a fine or an extra fine. Yeah, so this is what a stub does. It's beautiful. Right, you don't have to do anything but write, and the line varies depending on whether you're on the flat part or on the thin part. So my name is Nicola Pang, uh, and uh, I I run a business. I I have a uh, I guess I would call my business either Entropy Inc. or Nick's Nibs and things. And uh, I sell dip pens and calligraphy supplies, and also fountain pens. And I restore vintage fountain pens, and also in some cases make uh, put together the kind of fantasy versions of vintage pens. Um, I got into calligraphy because in 2013, after I left my last job, I had a, a, an accident that broke my, my right arm in six places. And um, it was a really severe accident, but you know, since I just left my job, I didn't have like medical insurance or anything anymore. So, you know, public health, uh, you know, Obamacare was allowed me to be able to get it fixed, but it didn't really cover like physical therapy. I didn't want to pay the type of money that it would have cost for that. So I took it upon myself to take up handwriting in order to regain muscle control and you know that sort of stuff after all the surgeries. Uh, and I just kind of kept doing it. And now I'm going into my sixth year doing calligraphy. Uh, two years ago, I started a job at Stanford teaching uh, as an outreach sort of community thing. And um, now it's something that uh, per quarter over there, we've gotten up to 150 people, you know, per quarter in. And I do some of their certificate work at Stanford. So that's... Okay. Can you show an example of what you do? Sure. Let me see. That. So, George Bruno. How long does it typically take ink to dry? Uh, it kind of depends on the ink and the humidity and stuff, but um, this is this is iron gall, so this will probably take, uh, in this I would say, maybe about eight minutes to fully, fully dry. And actually one of the things that's interesting about this is that the iron gall ink is actually little, essentially iron filings in, uh, in an acidic substance. So it'll actually get darker and darker and darker as it oxidizes. Um, so over time it'll become super, super black. Yeah, so I mean, and you know, I, I love calligraphy just because uh, I think I've always liked writing in general, but um, 
I was told you are one of the top calligraphers in the world. Uh, I think that might be a bit of a stretch. I know I'm not, I, I know I'm not, uh, I know I don't suck, but, um, you know, but I, I think there's so many people that are more skilled than I am or, or more creative. I just do my best to express what it is that, that I want to try to create on a page. And, you know, I think, I, I think that most, you'll find that most of the, a lot of artists in general perhaps, but I think especially with calligraphers, um, you know, most of the, most of us just want to express, uh, you know, we kind of write and I think that's part of the attraction of writing is that people just want to be able to express their own, their own voice, you know. Uh, and writing and like the actual act of writing uh, manually and writing instruments, I think, is a uh, is kind of an extension of our our desire to be understood, you know. So. Taking off. The italics. <clears throat> Thanks. What is the future of calligraphy for Nick? Future of calligraphy for me? Um, that's a good question. Um, I know that I'm going to enjoy practicing and you know, I, I think that even if, if I didn't have a job doing this, it would be something that I would spend time doing every, probably every day. Um, you know, the, the, my accident was a really painful experience for me because uh, uh, you know, I played, uh, played an instrument for a long period of time. I was a cellist for a long period of time. And so, you know, in a way, this is something that I feel is a sort of, you know, part of the healing process is just sort of mentally as well as just physically. Um, and it means a lot to me. I, 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 I think that it's, uh, I think that letter form and our ability to imprint in time sort of our ideas and thoughts and some part of our personality through, uh, through writing, which is, you know, something pretty unique that only humans do. Um, I think there's something kind of, I want to say magical, but there's something about it that, that speaks to me. So I think I would do it no matter what. Um, me personally, I think I, I want to, I teach calligraphy and continue doing this stuff because I think that it's, it's something that unfortunately in our modern world, not, not everybody gets a chance to, especially younger people, they don't get much of a chance to express themselves in a way that is useful in everyday life. And I think writing is one of those things. So at the very least, I'll likely be teaching it for the foreseeable future. And, uh, you know, I think I have ideas of what I'd like to create. And those ideas have been things that have been around since before I even started really getting into calligraphy itself, um, like actually, you know, getting good at it. And, uh, you know, to see that vision slowly over these years, you know, the skill set and stuff to be able to pull off some of those things. You know, I think that like trying to get as close to whatever I had as a mental idea of what I'd like to get um, as my skill set, um, you know, th that's something that, I, that that's, that's as close as I can predict for what my future has. So, yeah.